This is a headgum podcast. We live on a mountain right at the top. This beautiful view from the top of the mountain. Every morning, I walk towards the edge and throw little things off, like car parts, bottles, and cutlery, <laughs> or whatever I find lying around. It's become a habit, a way to start the day. I go through all this <laughs> before you wake up so I can feel happier to be safe up here with you. <laughs> I know somewhere we could go better than you could ever know. Hello. Go shove yourself. I know someone we could be out in disguise, a tree. Hello. Go show yourself goal I know. You and me. That was my mashup of two iconic songs, Hyper Ballad by, of course, Bjork, and Hello by Babes in Toyland. <laughs> I'm a musical genius. Call me girl talk. The year is 1998. <laughs> Okay, what happened in 1998? Well, I'm going to tell you the major news of 1998 to get you hot and horny for today's episode. Google was invented in 1998. Huge. Another huge thing. Apple unveils the iMac. Crazy. Another crazy thing that happens, thank, and I thank God for this every single day, the FDA approved Viagra. Thank God. What would we do without it? We don't know. Biggest movies in 98, Saving Private Ryan, Armageddon, and of course, one of my favorites, There's Something About Mary. And we can't go without saying the number one movie of all time, Titanic, came out in 1998. That two VHS purchase, which I remember very vividly, not to age myself. Anyway, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck won the Oscar for Goodwill Hunting. Sexiest Man Alive was Harrison Ford. The Boy Is Mine by Brandy and Mott. Brandy and Monica, number one on Billboard. After that, Getting Jiggy With It by Will Smith. Now you're wondering, where were we when Lauren Hill released The Miseducation of Lauren Hill and when the Goo Goo Dolls came out with Iris? We were in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. And we are, you guys, <laughs> this is fucking me up today because my guests are literally like icons, icons to me in high school, icons to me now, Tegan and Sarah. Woohoo! That was. <laughs> does it feel like that was a really big year, or is that how everybody feels when they hear what things happened the year they graduated? Because that feels pretty big. I will say, '98. That's a heavy hitter year. That's like you. You do get some years where you're like, "Holy shit!" The world. That's a year where we really feel the world changing. You know what yeah. I mean? Sure. And is it Viagra that was changing the world with those rock hard? <laughs> cocks all around town probably not google not imac but viagra probably less relevant to me because i came out as a lesbian in 1998 <laughs> but who who really cares i hate everything that you listed except for the miseducation of lauren hill every of single course. you didn't like goodwill hunting or an imac Come no on. because no but i didn't know anything about imacs in 1998 like everything about 1998 I, re I remember feeling like there was a huge shift happening, like, culturally. I mean, we had started high school. When Tegan and I started high school, you know, it was sort of like we were still sort of like, like the height of, like, grunge and alternative yeah. music. We were, you know, we were um, we were definitely, like, alternative and, and kind of outsidery. But it did feel like we were sort of, like, I don't know. We were just, like, in, in, in sync or lockstep with, um, you know, like, what was cool or what was happening culturally. And by the time three years had gone by, it was, like, Titanic, in sync, and getting jiggy with it. And we yeah. were just like, what the fuck is happening? Like, well, it just I seemed do, crazy. I do feel like musically, for sure, there was a huge shift between, like, early 90s indie rock grunge. And then it was, like, a full tilt catalyst into pop and kind of, like, shit 
pop rock like a back, you know? almost like a backlash like i wouldn't have called it a backlash then and you know i mean this is like all very quaint because i feel like trends change so drastically yeah and so quickly now but like back then you know it felt like i mean to use a um, cultural reference point from 1998 it felt like music changed the way that you know the titanic was slow you know like it just sort of was like it was you was know, that the problem with the titanic that it was slow well it was slow <laughs> it was just like slow and lumbering and then it hit that iceberg and you're just like yeah. you think to yourself like really you couldn't change course but um but i do think that there was this kind of like this like i i remember just thinking like oh man like everything sort of seemed like it was you know gloriously um alternative and cool and everything was changing and we were sort of lockstep and then it was like oh god we're graduating high school and we're sort of like spit out into the real world and there's all this like cultural mainstream stuff happening that felt really uh oppositional to where we were at in our lives which i think is you know is like really it's really interesting to think that we like launched our music career and really our adulthood from that sort of vantage point. But yeah, I just remember hating all the, all the things that you just listed. I'm like, oh man, those are like the worst parts of 1980. Well, yeah, you know, over here at Senior Superlatives, we just Google pop culture of the year and we <laughs> yeah. go very broad, you know? It we go- like I to like just, it. I like it. We I like do. to see what Google is saying to us as being true. Yeah. And for, you know, look, do we think over here that... uh do I ever actually want to watch Titanic again in my life? <laughs> Absolutely not. Do I have any interest in watching fucking Armageddon? No. Do I want to see Saving Private Ryan or whatever movie I literally just blocked out of my memory even though I said it <laughs> 20 seconds ago? No. But, you know, I would say musically, okay, do we hate the Goo Goo Dolls is a question. No. Not hate. I don't. definitely didn't hate. I think that... Here, here's the thing that I found in high school is a lot of the music that became really popular um, was just that much, like they were just that much older than us. Right. That we were either more interested in like going backwards. So like obsessing over, you know, historically cooler acts. For uh, sure. Or, or like indie rock, you know, yeah. like I think some of the stuff that was becoming really popular on radio, you know, like I just was reading an article about live you know, that band. Do you yes. know what I'm talking about? Um, lightning and crashes. Lightning crashes. Yeah. Cries. Imagine <laughs> that song <laughs> now. But that Imagine like out. a man band came out with that song about like, <laughs> like miscarriage now. Like it's a complicated what? band. Wow. It's, a, it's That's like a think piece. If somebody hasn't written it, please get on it. There's a very interesting piece in Rolling Stone actually about live and this wild, wild story. I highly recommend if you haven't I'm gone down that I'm going to read it after it's this. It's wild. But yeah, like Google Goo Dolls, Live, Candlebox, like a lot of these bands that became really, really, really big in the era where we were in, in sort of like high school. I feel I feel like we we listened to them because my parents were listening to them mm. and I and and the songs were just absolutely like omnipresent in radio and culture at that moment. Yeah. But I don't think we like attached to them because I think that's part of being in high school. It's like you carve out your identity during yeah. that time. And our identity was that we liked either old music or we liked punk rock or we like like anti-establishment acts like an Ani DeFranco right. for example so yeah that was just like much too mainstream so I don't really have an opinion now on those yeah. acts other than they existed I yeah. feel like okay I and I can sing all their songs <laughs> and that's good <laughs> yeah. I feel like I I kind of feel like um I grew up in Washington DC which is like you know punk hardcore mm-hmm capital of the states some might say so like i remember when i was in high school taking a lot of pride in being like i listen to minor threat i listen to bad brains i love totally. ian mckay like this mm-hmm. is like my like identity so i do kind of feel like there are two types of high school personalities you're either the kind of person that is like constantly seeking whatever is not the present that's being shoved to you by, you know, pop culture, or you're someone that's like so fully in pop culture and that's what you're consuming, that I did always feel like there was a very jarring split between types of high school people. And it's like, that's something that I think is... So Especially specific. in that era. Yeah. I think it's Especially just so specific era. to being a teen. I think like now the internet has created so many subcultures that Mm -hmm. like 
to teens now, there kind of isn't a monoculture to like mm-hmm. latch on to, I guess, yeah. other than Billie Eilish, maybe. I don't know. This is me sounding like probably an out of touch fucking like fringe <laughs> idiot. But um, when you guys were in high school, what was your high school like? Like what was what was the vibe? What was going on? It sounds I don't know. You guys sound so intimidatingly cool that I'm wondering what it was like for you both. And also, you guys are identical twins. So, like, yeah, well, that must have well, been complicated too. We we grew up in a in a in a time where the 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 kids that were popular or the kids that sort of like uh, ascended to the top of the hierarchy in high school are, were not like the kids that were um, maybe popular in American schools. Like, so like like football cheerleaders, mm-hmm. like all those kind of tropes that a lot of like a lot of people. Um, recognized from their own experiences or from like TV and film uh, popularized, you know, I, I think um, for many generations, that was not our experience. We went to like an inner city school. It was really diverse. There was, uh, it was a big school, which we've now learned through writing our memoir about that time and making a TV show about that memoir in high school. Um, we've learned that at the time, Calgary was really growing. It was like a, it was a city sort of like re- expanding it, um, you know, exponentially because of, you know, industry and immigration. And, um, and there was actually a shortage. There was like, there was, there was not enough high schools. And so a lot of kids ended up kind of get going to, going to high schools that were out of district or that, um, ended up being like really, um, like overpopulated, I guess. So we were a big school. We were like at the time, I think it was like almost three thousand kids went to our went Whoa. to our high school. So it was a big school, and it was like a really diverse um, population that was um, maybe maybe actually quite representative, actually, of what was happening in the city at that time. Like we went to school with a lot of kids from like um, like like Lebanon and Iran, and um, there was a there was a sort of like. Uh, there was like a hockey culture, which I guess is a kind of a Canadian stereotype. But like the kids that I remember being popular, they were either like kids that were like real tough and were maybe like misbehaving a little bit like drugs, gangs, etc. Mm-hmm. They sort of like ruled one part of our school. And then there was kind of like the hot high school, like, you know, um, athlete guy. But it wasn't like associated with the school. It was like hockey teams like it was mm. like hockey, hockey guys. So those were like kind of like the kids that ruled the school. And then there was, um, you know, there was lots of kids in our school who were alternative and into rave culture, into music culture. And we all sort of assembled ourselves together, even though we didn't necessarily have like a common thread musically. Like so Mm. kids that were going to raves, they were listening to electronic music, maybe hip hop, that kind of thing. And we were um, and, you know, we were listening to like Tegan said, you know, alternative music, punk music. But the common thread, I guess, was just that we didn't we weren't listening to Will Smith's uh, get jiggy with it. So we were kind of like, um, so we were all like, yeah, I sort of like see like, um, I sort, you know, we all sort of like connected that we were, um, representative of sort of the margins or the, the underground music scenes or whatever. And, and we all kind of like bonded together and formed, you know, quite a large, um, I guess like ecosystem within that high school. So we didn't, you know, we weren't like picked on. I wouldn't say that we were like the popular kids. And I think in the first couple years of high school, you know, we definitely had to sort of like, keep our heads up like we weren't the um you know we we were were weird we were really we were definitely weird but by the end of high school we were trendsetters you know we were like we were the kids who were we were going to raves and seeing like all the popular kids at the raves like trying to buy drugs and we were like oh this is done this is this is this is a bust now so like we did see that arc of like oh we're cool we kind of like know what's coming and then by the time we got out of high school we were sort of like Okay, we're on to the next thing. So our high school experience was like, I think, generally positive, but the school was rough. Lots of drugs, lots of fighting, lots of gang violence. Um, There was, uh, yeah, there was just like we used to make jokes that it was like (laughs) Dangerous Minds starring Michelle Pfeiffer a little (laughs) bit, like but the Canadian version. Like, you know, there was just I remember coming home from like the first week of high school and, you know, we would just regale our parents with these stories like, you know, all oh, these guys chase this other group of guys and beat the shit out of them with pipes on the bus. And my mom would just be like, OK, well, be careful. You know, like that was like how oh, we grew up. God. Like it was just like what it was. I'm not even lying. I mean, That's I'm totally not like crazy. Yeah. Do you feel like you both had a very similar experience like I'm always so interested in talking to twins because I in my graduating class from high school there were nine sets of twins 
What? I know. I know. That is crazy. (laughs) It's really crazy. It's like, it was really, really, really crazy. And like, I think four of them were identical. Um, And I like to call those real twins. Yeah. We like to call those real twins. Because the other ones, we don't know. Like, that could be like, that could be engineering. That could be IF, IVF. That could just be like, you know, overactive ovaries. But like, identical twins to me, that's like that. Those are the real twins. Those are the real twins. I mean, look, you could also be someone that like had a one year old, immediately got pregnant and was like, let's hold them back and let's say that they're a fraternal (laughs) twin and let's just like weave this story. Do you feel like you were able to differentiate yourselves? Like, or were you always so? close or like did you feel like you had jarringly different experiences at any point in high school because I just like the the emotions of teendom is something I'm so interested in and something I think is so singular and beautiful about being a teenager and how do you guys feel that you were similar and different in in those journeys as teens I mean I think Sarah and I generally speaking had pretty similar experiences like through our youth but in writing our memoir definitely some of the interior world like experience was was pretty like vastly different you know um sarah sort of established at least inside of herself that she was queer way earlier than i did i think it was always like a question for me and i knew i had crushes on my girlfriends in like middle school but once i got to high school it became much more obvious, but I think for Sarah, it happened earlier and she just had more internalized homophobia and fear about coming out and being found out. Whereas for me, like it never really freaked me out. Like once I, just like everybody else had a secret relationship with my best friend, like my (laughs) journal, my journal was like all like cap locks, me being like, oh my God, this is amazing. You know, like for me, it was, it was like, you know, I wrote about it as like, it was sort of like completing the Rubik's cube. It was like snapping it into place for me. Like it just, it actually was like, it, it, it just made me feel better. So, but I, I think externally our experience was pretty similar. And I think it was sort of one of almost being celebrities, unlike your experience, which I'm still marveling at. There were not as many visible identical twins. And if there were, they were very different than us. You know, Sarah and I were visually very big, you know, we wore like 36 inch waist pants like which is what my stepfather who was six foot four like we were stealing his <laughs> pants you know they were like dragging along the ground we had huge uh chains Sarah had a huge metal chain that went down past her knee that she wore and I had a plastic one that I would spray paint different colors we wore raver kind of like a mix of like rave slash punk alternative clothes and yeah. so we were we were like we were a sight you know and so i think we really popped out and i think people really whether they liked us or not everybody sort of knew who we were and probably because we were so visually stimulating it was it wasn't like we were getting bullied in a corner like you know so so, you know i think we had an experience in high school that's like a mix of we were definitely outsiders we were definitely in the margins but then there was also sort of a gregarious outgoingness to us that allowed us to sort of have a pretty big experience in high school and I think, you know, we both love music so much and we both loved our friends a lot and love to socialize. And we, I think, ended up, you know, having like it, I've interviewed a lot of twins recently because we have a twins project that we're putting together. And like I've heard like harrowing stories about like identical twins who fought so much they went to different schools or just one was into sports and one was more of like an academic. And so they really didn't socialize together. But I think Sarah and I had enough similarities and enough crossover that we kind of did have a very similar I think experience in high school, like a lot of the shitty things that happened happened to both of us, and a lot of the great things that happened happened to both of us. By the well, time we got to high, high school, too, our school was gigantic, and we were not in any of the same classes. Like there was times where I would only see Tegan maybe like at lunchtime or something too. So I also think there was like just as an example of how big our school was in grade twelve, there was a girl who sat beside me in my biology thirty class, and Tegan and I had become sort of like city famous because we had won this. Battle of the Bands competition and we were on the cover of this music magazine and the girl was like I remember her holding up she'd never spoken to me in three years but she held up the magazine and pointed at me and then pointed at Tegan and was like which one's you and I was like that one and then she was like 
who the hell is this? <laughs> like, like she had no idea that we were two people. She was like, I've seen you emphasis on you individual one human yeah. you know for three years but like where's that girl and I was like she's in the school too like I think also there was like an invisibility or like a misconception or misunderstanding about us if you weren't like in our zone or in our world so I didn't always feel like I knew that or that people knew that I was well, a twin we were also basically drug addicts I mean we got stoned well, multi- multiple times at, well okay by definition we were basically <laughs> drug addicts because we got stoned multiple times a day every single day so Absolutely. you know you generate your own own definition of that but by my definition we were basically drug addicts we were constantly stoned we were pretty aimless and one of my favorite stories is in senior year when we no longer were really getting high um a girl that was in my English class. We were sitting next to each other in the library and I started talking about something that had happened in the school in 10th grade. And she looked at me completely baffled and confused. And at one point I was like, what? She said, wait, you went to our school? Like all, I just thought you like transferred in this year. And I'm like, no, we've been here the whole time. And like, once we sort of dug into it, she was like, oh, you were one of those drug addict degenerates that hung out in the hallway. And our crew of friends, we were called the hallway, you know, and there was a couple dozen, there was like a couple dozen of us. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were in the hallway. She was like, oh God. She's like, I thought all of you guys were such losers. (laughs) And I was like, okay. Okay. okay, okay." I mean, I can identify, (laughs) I guess, by Tegan's standards. I too was a drug addict in high school. (laughs) I was constantly smoking all the time. I was was like an alley kid smoking cigarettes. No one smokes (laughs) cigarettes anymore. I'm like, can people start smoking cigarettes again? They're bad. (laughs) I know. Debbie always says, don't tell them that. But people look dumb with vapes. (laughs) Everyone I know, everyone. I know in our age group everyone I know in our age group is smoking cigarettes again just so you know just there you go thank god exactly it's a real (laughs) bug I mean I just think that those the vape looks like everybody's sucking on like a big like a a USB USB hard drive or something and I think it looks it's like you're gonna wreck your body just do it like a cool person yeah I'm like give me a fucking Marlboro or something like give me (laughs) flames give me smoke give me magic like whatever happened to the fantasy of a cigarette now we have a fucking USB thing it's awful okay I need to know would you guys ever swap I have to ask I know it's annoying you probably are asked this all the time would you guys ever swap we never swapped I think one time I went to one of Tegan's classes because she was wanting to skip and so I just like thought it was funny to sit in her class and the teacher knew and so I you know I think like we did there was definitely like it's it's really strange about being a tw- one of the things of being an identical twin is is that there are people who just totally know the difference yeah and then there are people who are like you know helpless hopeless like they just it happens every day there's just somebody who meets us and will say tegan's there i'll never remember like they're just like unapologetically face blind and they're yes. just like no i will never know which one and i won't even try and then there's just people who are like you look as different to me as like you know like you couldn't be more different you know right. so i just i think like I as think a tw- my theory is that people that are really great with names are really good at telling twins apart because i yeah. actually don't think sarah and i look similar enough to mistake us what's confusing is that you'll meet us together you'll hear both our names at the same time and you can't figure out which one is which but that's not because at one point you knew which one of us. like i think it's like i always say if i meet lesbians together like a couple and let's say their names are like <laughs> <laughs> Shit, I can never come up with names on the spot. Their, Just na- two, their names two are names. their names are names. Sarah. Their names are Sarah and Rose. Okay, fine. Sarah, <laughs> if I meet Sarah and Rose at the exact same time, even if they look really different, I might be confused about which one is Sarah and which one is Rose. And it has no idea it, or has nothing to do with the fact that they're twins or not twins. It's just two new names, two faces, kind of like samey because they're both lesbians. It, it can be confusing. So I do think like we never thought we could pull a fast one on teachers because I think teachers are excellent at putting yeah. a name and a face together. They end mm. up memorizing, especially in high school where they have probably see over 100 different kids, 150 different kids in their classes over the day. I think they're the types of people you cannot pull a fast one on. But this is not about high school. But the other day I need needed to go take a PCR test, but I'm not in 
the city. I'm out in the wilderness. And I suggested Sarah take my passport and go take the PCR test for me because <laughs> like there's no way on earth I have COVID. I'm in the middle of the forest by myself. I'm not seeing anybody. So it's like I'm not cheating. And Sarah wouldn't do it. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, fraud, fraud is different than like whoopsie daisy. I went to Tegan's bio class. You know, I think <laughs> I think. But here's another example. And I mean, maybe this happens to other siblings, too. But I just Tegan and I just had to apply for uh, for new passports and our passports are about to expire. And so I uh, mistaken mistakenly printed off a piece of documentation that has Tegan's name on it instead of my own and submitted my passport renewal application to the government of Canada, which is just the application, just probably like a U.S. passport application, just filled with warnings and reminders that you'll like go to prison forever if you lie about anything. Anyway, I'd like I like submitted my documents. And as I'm leaving the passport office, I realized the mistake. Like I realized the error that I've made. And I like for like two days lived in a state of like fear that I was like going to get in trouble or like, you know, the government was going to like freak out, whatever. And um, and I and I said to my partner, my like my wife, I said, I told her the whole scenario and she's like, they're not going to they're just going to look and see Tegan's name and they're just going to like even if they Google it, they're going to see that you guys are sisters and it's totally fine. You look the same. You're like you have the same face name, you know, history, whatever. And I was like, I think that might be a twin thing. She's also a twin. So she just was really blase about it. She just was like, "Mm, it's fine. And I don't think like if I went in there with like your you know a documentation that had your name on it like that might look really like fraud right, but like right. there's something about being twins and just knowing how everyone else sees you as so interchangeable like i don't feel interchangeable but like there is just this like there's just this like understanding that everyone else does see you as interchangeable that you can sort of flex sometimes and like yeah. you know go with it. even if it's annoying you know even if it's annoying i mean i i do Like, I am so, so close to my sister that I could not imagine what our relationship would be like if we were twins, because it already feels like I have a twin relationship with my sister. Like, we're so connected and we're so emotionally, like, just bound in a way that's Are you close? How close in age are you? We're four years apart. Which yeah, is that's pretty like close still. it's it's pretty close, but we also, you know, like I think when you go when you go through a lot of trauma together, it bonds mm-hmm. you. And I think like we've just there's something there's some otherworldly like spark fiber connectivity between us that feels deeper than just us being siblings which I Mm -hmm. always would fantasize about having a twin because Mm -hmm. I think having a twin is so cool because you're you were just like from the second you're just you are merged in this like inexplicable way and I think it's so interesting Sarah that you're married to a twin yeah yeah, it's it's. I mean, she's married. Fraternal twin. Or, sorry, she's she's lucky to be with a real twin. I'm an identical twin. She is a fraternal twin, which is sort she's of like a fake twin. She's a fraudulent twin. So she's a twin. fake twin. Yeah, but I but I do think. Um, all joking aside, there is something really unique about the. Especially as you get, I think, get older and you, if you become a parent, for example, like recently I became a parent and watching the process of seeing a human being grow inside of another human being, it is wild to imagine two of them in there. Like I don't, fraternal or identical aside, like I couldn't believe that there was a human baby living inside of the person sleeping next to me. Like there's something very science fiction-y about how just like how their body changes and then just like at some point you know i could just see sid like kicking her kicking like i could see his like little foot and his little hand moving around inside of a body it's very alien but the thought of two human beings in Crazy. there is really strange and and you know and i think this idea this narrative that we carry around with ourselves um as twins is is probably stronger than whatever bond you know we think we have with each other like it's just this idea that like when i was when i was coming into existence so were you and that studio apartment we shared inside of our mother's you know stomach like that was wild you know like and then we had this like experience of like you know going through every developmental stage together like you know like there's something really remarkable about that and and the sort of contrast compare thing that happens between twins 
even fraternal twins, you know, I think is really, um, you know, I think it's just like really profound. I've always been very fascinated by non twins obsession with twins because it's, <laughs> it sort of feels like, um, it sort of feels like it's very, Non twins when they're talking about twins, it makes me think that like everyone who isn't a twin is like very lonely, like on an existential <laughs> level. And so they are like very thirsty for this like this like completion story that they would have if they had a had another person like them in the world, which I think is yes. like a sort of it's it's sort of like a beautiful thing that's, you know, both explored and unexplored in probably, um, you know, in, in many ways, not even just under the umbrella of twinness but like you know we all come into this world and we are all really sort of alone and we're looking for our partner we get married we have we're like obsessed with marriage and children and immortality and all of these things but i don't think twins like i mean here's like this for me anyway i don't think twins solves that existential crisis of just knowing that you are just like a meat sack alone in this world and you're just gonna like you come into it alone and you die alone like i'm not actually merged with tegan we really are two different bodies and two different minds and no matter how close and no matter how similar our dna and our you know our our faces look or all of these things you know we are just alone too you know and i think that totally i, th I think that like this idea that non-twins imagine that this this longing, this, 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 like, you know, this like loneliness or something that could be fixed or remedied with, with another version of themselves is, is untrue. And, um, you know, I don't want to burst people's bubble, but that's just, you, you would feel just as fucked up and alone in this world with a twin. Honey, you heard it here first. You're born alone. You die alone. We hate to break it to you. And those are just the facts of life. And we can all collectively agree only children are freaks. Sorry to my producer, Tevi. Only children are freaks. We can say, I will likely probably have one child if I decide to do that and I will raise a freak and I am happy to say <laughs> that I will do that mm -hmm. um I need to go back to high school. I need to know, were you guys in love in high school? What was going on in the love life? I feel like musically, what was the inspiration? Was it, you know, I'm asking these questions. I feel like I know the answer, but for my audience that isn't listening to the best music on earth, I would like there to be some elaborating done as to what was going on with you guys in high school and relationships and things of that sort. I mean, I think for me, as I said earlier, although Sarah disagreed, I, um, in 10th grade, I was madly in love with drugs mm. and um, music and my friends. You know, I was, I, that had started in ninth grade, which was still middle school where we grew up. Um, but I think we'd made friends with a crew of girls in ninth grade who just, we were mesmerized by and they were like colorful and amazing and very different than the kind of friends we'd had prior to that. And when I got to high school, it was just, I, it's, it's weird to say it because you're not an adult at 15, but basically I just, I felt like I was an adult. I felt like, you know, um, my our mom worked evenings and my stepdad was really busy with his life and we were alone a lot and did a lot of drugs and like used to sneak out a lot and I just was in love with the whole thing it was real messy I mean looking back it was pretty dark and depressing too but um yeah I was just mesmerized with everyone that I knew and obsessed with just getting kind of messed up and listening to music and uh by the time I got into 11th grade I had like gotten really close with one girl in particular and had been sort of best friendless and she asked me to be her best friend which was like you know the high school equivalent of asking me out you yeah know? and uh and I was real smitten with that whole situation and then in 12th grade actually like we got together and fell in love with each other and told each other what was going on and it was you know it was really amazing but it's also like terrifying you know it was 12th grade we weren't going to go to university I was at that point had sort of swapped out drugs for music and her and all our friends were making their plans to go off into their other lives. And I think for me personally, I became really fixated on this idea that we could be musicians and that we didn't have to go to university and um, just became, you know, almost singularly focused on that when I wasn't with my secret best friend, girlfriend, you know, and, and, and at the same time as I was like planning what would I would do after high school, we, we, her and I would talk about it, but she was going to school abroad. And I remember it just would make me sick to think about like that we were going to be apart. Cause it was, Ugh. you know, 
like we, we had a computer at home, but we didn't have the internet yet. You know, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have any of that stuff. So I just like had no concept of like how we would stay in touch and how we would stay in love and be in a relationship. And, but you know, at the same time, I also didn't have a clue how we'd become professional musicians. I just had faith that it would happen. So like that was sort of high school was just me focused on any, uh, on all of that. I never thought about school. I was a very average student. Yeah, I was I gonna say, going, were you guys good students? No, I went to school to to get drugs and see my friends. What kind <laughs> we of were, drugs are we talking about outside we like, of weed? We smoked a lot of weed and we did acid a lot. Like Fabulous. I'm sure we were doing. We were mostly. We were probably doing it a couple times a week. And you know years. what? Therapeutic. Some might say a therapeutic approach <laughs> sure. to LSD. <laughs> <laughs> That's one way of looking at that time. I think it was somewhat therapeutic. I I I think that Tegan and I. It was very obvious to teachers who were uh, paying attention that we were smart and that we were certainly not working to our full potential. And our school was not like an a- academic. Uh, a, you know, a, a school where people were like focused on a- academics. I think there was like, there was a, a, a like a small part of the population that was going to go on to college and university and and sort of had aspirations for that type of higher learning. And then the rest of us were, I think, almost like either just like f- there to complete the high school education and or looking for a vocation. Like our school had a, you know, had like a really pretty serious um, automotives program, fashion program, dance program, theater program. So, you know, know, in some ways it was uh, um, accidentally an art school before that kind of became a thing. And so a lot of kids that were at the school were, were sort of like looking outside of the traditional uh, pipeline of, of, of second post-secondary education, which really bugged my mom because she had uh, gone back to school as an adult and, and, and furthered her, her education as a single parent mom. And it had been such a struggle. And my mom, and, you know, was obviously looking to us and going, Hey, do it, do it the fun way. <laughs> like go when you're yeah. 18 and go get a degree and like, don't, you know, don't, don't fuck up your life and do it the hard way. And, and we were sort of surrounded by all these people whose aspirations sort of, um, you know, seemed so appealing. It was like, uh, entrepreneurial. I wouldn't have used that word back then, but like, you know, there was this kind of like, do it yourself, get out into the world, roll up your, you know, your sleeves and kind of like, um, and experience something attitude that I really adopted. And, um, and also my mom, you know, she was such a hero and had gone back to school and had become this like just legend to us. But it also looked so hard. You know, I didn't want to do that. I was like, I don't want to do that. That doesn't look fun. It wasn't like she was doing keg stands and living in a dorm and like having the time <laughs> of her life. She was dropping us off at daycare, going to school, you know, picking us back up and then and then working night shifts, you know, to pay the bills. So it didn't look fun to me. And I'm not blaming her. But being a musician did seem fun. So I just yeah, just did, I was sort of like. I was there to get enough. I was there to get an average grade so that my mom wouldn't ground us off the telephone and would let us go out with our friends. And that was basically all I cared about. And, you know, in terms of love, I was absolutely obsessed with girls. Like I was, I would now you, I would describe myself starting in about probably, probably as early as seventh grade, but realistically more like ninth grade as girl crazy. Like I, I look, I think about it now and it was just, it was all consuming. That's all I thought about was, was girls. And I was really like turning it over in my mind. Like it wasn't as straightforward as like, oh, I, I'm girl crazy and I have crushes on all, every girl on the planet. I was just like, why? Is th- I couldn't stop thinking about girls. Like I just, you know, even not even sexually initially because I didn't really know how to even like sort of like think in that framework. I just was like. Oh, Krista's hair is so beautiful and I like it when Krista passes me in the hallway and smiles mm. at me like which hallway should I go between classes so that I can see Krista and then it was like oh, I'm into this girl I'm into this girl like I just all, that's all it just was just so preoccupied by thinking about girls and and wondering about them and wondering are they thinking about me and what are they thinking about and um and then you know by grade 10 and uh, I was, you know, I was having a secret relationship with a girl and then also just like hooking up with any girl that would hook up with me. <laughs> like, you know, I don't know. It was like a very, it was a very free time. Um, it was a very intoxicated time. And people, people are so, um, suspicious of our retelling of high school because they're like there's how is it possible that in Calgary in 19, in the 1990s, like in this like unhip, 
world that they imagined that Tegan and I were just like slaying with girls. Like, how is it possible? Like, people are like, it was a fucking desert and I didn't even meet anyone until I was like 27. <laughs> how is it that you had like a class full of girls who were just like willing to hook up with you after a couple of like, you know, watermelon coolers? And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. We went on to be international like queer icons like is it possible yeah. that we just like were like the Bermuda Triangle for girls that were gay enough maybe no. I don't know I would just like to say honey I wouldn't need a watermelon cooler to hook up <laughs> with either of you okay I was so as a stick over here but I do think like people don't understand that like women teen girls there is a whole underbelly to queer oh, teen yeah. girls that oh, like yeah. Yeah. people don't know what's going on we're all fucking each other yeah. and that's the truth and boys, too. Boys, boys too too. boys they are too all, they're in their little they're like I have talked to guys as like as an adult now and they'll be like oh yeah like guys are just like jerking each other off in the locker rooms and they're having they're like you know like doing weird crazy things with each other and they're like or getting blowjobs or whatever and they're experimenting the same way that girls are but they have like we just we tell ourselves that it is not gay or it's just whatever horsing around or it is whatever but like I think if you make yourself like available to it which I certainly was making myself available like in a very like desperate kind of way to any girl that was interested in hooking up I was sort of like flashing my neon sign and yeah. I didn't even know that I was like I didn't even know it and I and and when we when we started writing our memoir about high school I really like it, like sort of like immersed myself in that time and ended up talking to a lot of people who I'd sort of lost touch with from that time. And they were like, yeah, we wanted to hook up with you. <laughs> you know, you yeah. and your sister, we wanted to hook up with you and that we knew that you were hooking up with other girls. And so once that rumor gets going around, you just, you're, you're, you know, we're animals. We just, we file that information like, oh, I have these ideas about girls and I want to hook up with girls and I've heard that you know Tegan or Sarah does that so like you kind of put yourself in the zone for that to happen and I don't think it's that unusual I just think we were like particularly gay enough well you know like how they say some people are just born cool like you can't like manufacture it some people are just like born cool people you are two people that are just like born cool and nice. when you're born cool people are immediately and people want to fuck you no matter what is the thing about when you're born cool and like oh, sorry honey that's just the way the cookie <laughs> crumbles for some of us and I do think like you know I started masturbating in bed when I was in the seventh grade next to my best girlfriend and at the time I was like oh we're just Both. masturbating next to each other I don't know what that means but this is cool and then mm -hmm. like it's like things like that that you're yeah. in hindsight you're like oh maybe that was a little gay you know and then you're like but I don't know you just <laughs> do it and like the, I feel like more people have those experiences than they're willing to admit and yeah in high school and in middle school. I mean, we're all just like horny little hormonal freaks walking around. And when you it's have a very one experimental time, it's yes. a very experimental time. And I think you're right that I think you get you become an adult and you sort of just suppress. Like I've had some very funny conversations with, um, you know, adults who had much less alternative, much less experimental adolescence. But like when you really dig into it with them, a couple drinks in, they're like, oh yeah, I did always take my shirt off and rub up against my, you know, best girlfriend when I was like seven. And you're like, yeah, like, I think, I think it, it's there, you know, the <laughs> yeah. experimentation, it's there. And, and that's great. You know, it's also like, I know for both Sarah and I, the the sort of part of the journey of going back and writing our memoir and, and spending literally years focused on high school in the last few years, like just, you know, interviewing people, reconnecting with old friends, hanging with our high school crew, looking at VHS footage, reading through journals, looking through photos, talking to perfect strangers about being in high school for the last couple of years. I'll say that, you know, one of the things I feel the most lucky that like about was that we just, we had such an open-minded crew of friends yeah, and we really all had each other's back. You know, we really watched out for each other. A lot of our parents were like, you know, we had every single person we knew had a double working household. Like everybody was busy. Everyone was like, no one was really supervising any of us. And when you talk to all of our parents, the reason why they felt like they could kind of let us run wild was because we really watched out for one another. And I think part of that was that we were, 
all really open to experimentation, even if it was just drugs. But yeah, some of yeah. it, you know, was just like we really watched out for one another. There wasn't very much judgment. And um, even though being queer in the 90s and growing up inner city and, you know, facing some of the things we did, like when I look back at like our high school experience as a whole, that's the overwhelming feeling I get is just like luck. Luck yeah. that we had the people we did and that we got to try all the things we did and that we left high school fairly intact, you know? I need to ask two more questions before we go into the high school guidance counselor's office. One being, did you two communicate with each other about being queer in high school? Like, did you guys tell each other that you were having secret relationships or no? We never talked to each other about what was going on, the secret relationships. And I think, you know, to some degree, it was just because they weren't that secret. When I say mm. secret, I just mean we didn't talk about it. You know, we right. all of our friends knew. Everybody knew what was going on. We were – there was lots of uh, relationships happening um, that weren't being spoken about. We weren't the only ones who were having those kinds of relationships. Um, so, you know, to be fair, it wasn't that we weren't just telling each other. We just didn't really, like, vocalize or talk about those things. We didn't really have the language, you mm. know, back then to talk about those things. And, I, I mean, it'll really – not no pressure, but I think that if you do end up reading our memoir, I think it will, like, blow your mind. There's a section where – we actually have a transcript, but there is video footage of it that we've included on the internet as well. But there's an interview um, between uh, between the two of us. We're on camera, and then off camera are our two best friends, who are our secret girlfriends, <laughs> and they are um, they are doing a project on homosexuality, and they are asking us questions about homosexuals, and we are all talking about homosexuality and homosexuals. These were words that were common to use to differentiate between. Uh, people who were as <laughs> probably in our minds were really gay and then we, and and were like not us. And then there was us, you know, just the girls who are just all chatting about gay people who are gay, you know, yeah, and yeah. having gay relationships. And there's this like profound, you know, gap between the content, like wh what we were having a conversation about and how we identify as 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 girls who are all sleeping with each other. And, you know, Tegan is so brutally cute in this video because she's also like, you know, really just like, um, you know, encouraging and like, you know, gay people are great and sexuality is fine and da, 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 da. And you can see in the video that I am crawling out of my skin. I mean, I right. am so desperately afraid to be found out. I am in such turmoil. It's very painful for me to watch because I can see that that was all there. Like I was just so... I was just struggling so much. And I think, um, you know, the fact that these relationships existed, even though they were secret in secret, you know, they I think in some ways they really kept me alive because they um, they allowed me to be very present in my body and in my mind and not in a negative way. Because the when I wasn't having those relationships, I was in total turmoil about what my feelings meant. What kind of future could I possibly have? Right. And, you know, but when I was just like with my secret best friend and not just having sex, like, I mean, we were just like deeply intimate. I mean, this is no surprise to any lesbians. It's like, you know, even at 15, I was having like a, a deeply emotionally intelligent, um, a reciprocal relationship. We were like 45 year old lesbians married living in the suburbs, you would have thought, you know, we're just like, what do you want to do with your day and your right. life? And how are you feeling? And like we were just having this like very connected relationship. And, you know, one of my biggest takeaways from writing the memoir, I'm still very, very close. My still consider her a best friend, my secret, my secret girlfriend from high school. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, like, it is if it wasn't clear to me before, it is clear to me now as a 40 year old woman writing this book, you taught me, you gave me all the tools and all the infrastructure to have successful, loving, reciprocal relationships in adulthood. Like I was having that at 15 years old with her. Like it was just so, uh, it was, it, it was just such, such a kind and loving relationship and basically was a polyamorous relationship, which I'm in a monogamous marriage, but I, I always say to, to, to Krista, like, I would just seem so boring on paper if you look at my adult relationships, like just like I'm in another monogamous relationship and right. everything's great. But that's a wild time with Krista, man. We were just like dating up a storm with other people and there wasn't a lot of jealousy. And she just was like doing her thing and I was doing my thing. And, and it made me a very um, trusting person who is not I'm not a jealous person and I'm not possessive either, um, which I know sounds strange because we do have an album called So Jealous, but it's more <laughs> like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know? <laughs> Um, 
do you okay then my second question I could just I hate I hate that we need to think, turn these things into an hour long episode I need to be fast <laughs> um, my other question is do you feel because I often feel this way that like the love the intensity of the love that I felt when I was in high school was so deep and intoxicating and like a drug and I think it's I for I believe that it can never that specific feeling can never come again in your life. And I wonder if you agree with me or disagree with me. And I think that it's different, of course, when we get older and we have diff- our lives change, we become more full individuals. And when you're a teenager, how can you even compare? But teenage love to me is something that's so like painful and special and I just wonder your thoughts on your thoughts on that I mean look you know if you were lucky and the way you're describing it I would I would go so far as to say it sounds like you were lucky enough to experience an intoxicating extreme exciting oh, by the way love? with a terrible person like yeah, this sure, is sure, a, sure. yeah 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 with, a, <laughs> sure. with an absolute monster of a person who still owes me an apology right call me <laughs> um, so yeah okay so i'll take a lucky if you had that experience in high school I, I i mean i don't know i don't feel like it's necessarily that common yeah again i'm only basing it on my own experience but having you know, written about high school and now made a TV show about it. We've had a lot of conversations with people and many people were like, why on earth were you guys so interested in your high school experience? Like most people just kind of write off their high school experience. So I think if you had a tremendous deep, even if it was excruciating, but like, you know, kind of like intense love at that age, that doesn't necessarily make you the majority. Um, But I do think what you're describing, which is just first love, whether it came in high school or in college or whatever it was, it is hard to recapture that. And as Sarah just said, if you are lucky enough to have somebody who teaches you some really usable and and healthy skill sets in that first love, that can be really monumental. Um, But first are first, right? It's hard to recapture your first and um, that intoxicating roller roller coaster ride. It's like, it's case by case. I, I certainly think I've had deeply, deeply intoxicating, exciting roller coaster rides in love since. Um, Did they capture the feeling of that first you know, experience. No, because I think I was really lucky. And and, and t- it's it is I parallel it with drugs or some sort of like experience. It's like it's hard to capture it the same way a second time. But I think love what's really amazing about it. And we've made a career out of writing about it is that every time you fall in love, at least in my case, and based on a lot of the people I've seen fall in love, you do convince yourself that your love is the most magical, most incredible, most unique experience. I mean, that's the kind of gross, intoxicated vibe of someone who's newly in love. Like yeah. they're, disgust- they're absolutely disgusting to be around because they're looking yeah. at you with this like sort of patronizing, you don't know what it's like. Like mm-hmm. what I'm experiencing right now, like it's the first of its kind. And it's like, no, it's not. But it, it, we have to have that feeling. We have to have that hormonal surge or else we wouldn't do things like spend 50 years sleeping next to that person or Correct. having children with them. Yeah. Or like, you know, maybe so too, I, maybe too <laughs> though, like necessary. maybe too, like, and this sort of ties back to what we were talking about with this desire for twinship, you know, for non-twins, this, this constant sort of pursuit, this, finding this other person who like completes us and all of that kind of um, stuff culturally and socially. I do wonder sometimes, uh, you know, first, first love. I mean, it's just easy. No brainer. It's like, yeah, it's the first time all that stuff is happening, good or bad. And it's so hard to, to sustain um, that period and that feeling. And as you get older, you realize that and you're like, Oh God, we've already started. So like now the countdown clock begins. When will I feel less of it? And then when will I feel not enough of it to, to, um, want this anymore? And I've been thinking a lot about this in the, in the context of having children. Cause I've, you know, I've become a mom and I am love, like I just love being a mom, but it's also, it's, it's, it's an opportunity. Having a child is like another opportunity to have the experience of yourself. 
Like, I don't know if that makes sense, but like the first time you fall in love, I mean, you are interested in this other person, but mostly I think a lot of what it is to be in a relationship is getting to be with yourself again. Like, yeah. oh, I'm, I'm so awesome. I'm so hot. Like, how do I deal with shit? How do I have sex? How do I, you know, whatever. It's so there is kind of like a selfishness or like a like a self-absorbed kind of feeling to being in love. And I think so is so is having a kid. You know, when I'm with Sid, I'm so consumed by him and I think about him all the time and I. I, I love him so much and I love experiencing myself as a parent. And mm. so it's like, you know, I can see how people, I can see why people make that connection of like um, having kids is kind of like, you know, a love that makes you feel like, um, like it, like it feels totally different. And yeah. I don't know if I, I don't know if I totally agree with that. It doesn't necessarily feel different, but it, it rubs up against the feeling that I, or the consuming nature of love when you first start feeling it when you start having it and um and it's uh and it's intoxicating and it and it sort of is like a barrier to the world you know like i walk around right now feeling like um everything that has to do with sid makes me feel good so why right. wouldn't i want more of that it's a drug you know right. and when i do all the things in my life that make me feel bad or don't make me feel much of anything i kind of want less of that in my life so you can feel this like this cloak of like I just want to be in the good feeling all the time and um yeah and I mean I I wonder I'm curious to see with kids if it changes if it's if it feels like less conditional you know like um than what love is cuz you know we all know as adults that um no no amount of connection or love makes you know being in a relationship easier it's just yeah. you know relationships are just fucking hard but when you you know you're in that new stage you tell yourself like oh this time it'll be different yeah Ah, I love, 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 love. I'm a sucker for it. Um, okay, now I think we are in the high school guidance counselor's office. And guess what? I'm the high school guidance counselor. Amazing. I'm so I'm so multifaceted at my job. I can be a therapist one second. Who knew? Um, in this <laughs> section of the show, we like to rectify a wrongdoing of your high school past. You can use this time to say fuck you to someone. You can use this time to apologize to someone. This kind of just heals whatever lingering high school trauma you might be carrying with you. And then after we talk about it once, you know, you never need to think about it again. That's kind of the amazing thing with therapy. You know, you just talk about it once and then it's over. So, uh, yeah, yield this time as pick, you will. I think if I were to pick one, it would be it's not a fuck you. But I think probably we didn't I didn't have any close relationships really with my teachers in high school. I, I was totally one of those cliche cases of girls that was like in advanced math Mm. in elementary school and then by the time I got to high school I was like barely passing math and I think it's because I became highly social and again all the things we've covered drugs yes. fixated yes. on girls music etc but um you know our early success as a band happened at the end of high school we won a contest and then we were like on the cover of like every music magazine in the city and on the radio and our local news stations came and did spots on us and you know within two years we were signed and and you know I've had this like 25 year career and like but every once in a while I think about like my math teacher and like mm. you know these teachers that treated me like the degenerate that I was and I've wondered did they have a moment at any point over the last 25 years where they were like <laughs> huh Really? <laughs> really? Uh, so it's not a fuck you so much as like, I do, I wish, I wish it had been different, you know? Like, I wish our relationship with our teachers had been different. I know for me, I chalk it up to like all those things that I just said, it's on me. But we also went to a huge, like a huge middle school with like 45 kids per class, you know? Like it just wasn't, there wasn't a lot of intimacy. And I, I just wonder, I wonder if some of those teachers that kind of gave me a lot of attitude uh, if they've ever thought to themselves, but I knew that they were going to make something out of their <laughs> lives or if they're like, no way. <laughs> they're all probably just jealous. You know, they're like, they're like, how can these high schoolers be famous rock stars? And I'm just a measly old stinky calculus teacher. <laughs> and it's, yeah, you know, I don't know. Maybe we did revisit our high school. We shot the first all the the scenes from our TV show are shot in our actual high school. That's so cool. And apparently one of the gym teachers who was there when we were there, shout out to Ms. Woods, apparently remembered us and sp spoke highly of us. But it's, um, yeah, it's a weird one. I mean, I only, I, I only wish good things of all those people, but yeah. I mean, the teachers, there was, there were teachers who really connected with us, like obvious, you know, English teachers. Yeah. Our, our drama teacher was a huge, 
um but we never so, spoke to him after i'm just saying like context yeah, it's like, afterwards saying, like, but he but yeah. in high school he was a real ally and yeah i support. don't mean when I, I right or wrong is probably not the right thing but i would say like i wish i knew i wish we were those kids that had gone back to high school after we'd been successful like i've seen like selena gomez did it and sh- you know sean mendes <laughs> like i've seen all these documentaries yeah. where they go back when to they, their like, high school show schools. up to their high school and everyone's yeah. freaking out and yeah, like and everyone's <laughs> asking for pictures and, and i don't like, want that i don't i don't like i didn't need fanfare but i would i'm like i wish we could have gone back a few years later and talked to the teachers and been like hi do you remember us were we as I big didn't. losers as we think i did That's, not that want would that be my thing that would be mine yeah. <laughs> I definitely wasn't ready to have that kind of like reckoning return for 20 years. It took 20 years for me to want to go back. And I think that's like probably a testament to, you know, the relationships that are so significant to us from high school. We're still friends with those people. Our story didn't end with them in high school, but the teachers, you know, they did play a pivotal role and it's easier to see their perspective now that we're adults and it's easier to see where they failed us and also where allyship was so profound. You know, I I don't remember ever seeing a guidance counselor when I was in high school except to beg to get into a class that I needed as a pre-requirement to apply for college. And she was such a bitch about it. And I had mm. to, like, get my mom to come in. So I don't really remember feeling allyship in that area. But, you know, without, without, a, without our drama teacher or without a couple of key adult figures in our life, it would have been a really – it would have been a lot bumpier. I remember feeling like – those 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 adults really made things easier especially when i was acting out like in 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 uh in grade 12 we had like a health class i think we called it uh calm which was like career and life management which is just like such a joke because we didn't learn anything in that class that helped us manage our career or our lives (laughs) but um we did have a sex uh like a like a like a representative of like this the the health board or something come down to talk to us about sex safe sex Trans, sexually transmitted diseases and I remember the class got out of hand real fast like people there was a discussion about AIDS that turned into like extreme homophobia and like you know derogatory words being thrown around and then um, you know the teacher not being able to ha- the, the the visitor not being able to handle the class and our teacher not being able to handle the class and it was one of those like out of body moments where I stood up and started having a confrontation with one of the boys who is who is being really really offensive and i ended up throwing i picked up a chair and i threw the the chair across the room at at him and ran out of the class like a movie and and disappeared down that like just like ran to the drama room because i was the only teacher mr job was our drama teacher and i remember thinking well, I, I mean, I knew I felt like he was gay, you know, and I just was like, he's safe and I, I can come and I'll, I'll be able to tell him what I've done and he'll protect me because I'm obviously going to be in like major trouble because I just right. threw a fucking chair at someone in a room three, three, three floors above me and I hid in his room and the, they were paging me over the PA system and he called the office and told them that I was down there and I didn't get in trouble. In fact, The guy who was being insane in the class and just so offensive, he got kicked out of the class. But I remember feeling so embarrassed, like so ashamed that I didn't want to go back to the class. And so I convinced the teacher to let me just do the rest of the year in the in the library by myself. I just would go to the library and hang out. I mean, the class was a total joke. Well, yeah, you know, but I just remember being like, I remember really like having that sense that um, that I was that I understood the boundaries of what was okay and what wasn't more than the adults in the room. Like it was obvious to me, like these kids are idiots. Of course, they're going to be saying crazy shit. But I remember that being like a really big moment in my life where I was like, I know better and I know what the future holds and the future is not going to be a place, a classroom where you can say these words and say these things and propagate these ideas that are outdated and horrible and harmful. And I remember feeling at the time shame. And now 20 years later, I feel pride about it yeah i was about to say if you picked up the chair in my health class immediately (laughs) in love immediately in love Um, i don't think that was the i don't think that was the reaction to by very many kids at the time but it did feel like a redemption story when i went back i had to get corroboration from kids that were in the classroom um for the publication like our the lawyers for our publisher were like you have to prove that this happened and um and there was this girl who i totally had a crush on who was like 
she rolled in a totally different crew than us. She was very popular and very like preppy, like preppy, like, you know, pretty straight, you know, whatever. But we just were randomly in this class together. She was a year younger than us. And um, and we were like, I don't know. She was just chill. Like she totally thought I was a weirdo, but she liked me and we did projects together. But I had such a crush on her. She was just like so not the kind of girl who I normally got to hang out with and spend time with. Like, you know, she smelled good. Like she just like did her hair for like what seemed like hours every morning before she got to school like I just was like what are you but um anyways I reached out to her because she was in the class and it was like really thrilling to be like just exchange messages with her and be like did I throw a chair actually I don't even think I led her I said do you remember an altercation in our comm class with me and this guy and she was like oh yeah you totally like threw a chair <laughs> like whatever and I was like so so you're still thinking about me yeah 25 years later <laughs> I was gonna say you know when you were throwing that chair in her mind she was like cause I'm your lady <laughs> I doubt it. I doubt yeah, it. I, I'm telling you, I know. Um, if you could go back in time and give your high school selves any advice, what would it be? I mean, before we wrote our memoir, we used to both joke like, get a haircut. Like we, when people would ask us that question, yeah. you know, uh, because it's the first thing I did once I got together with a girl, like in senior year, I like chopped all my hair off and just like grew this massive confidence. And so I, I'm always like, cut your hair sooner. But after writing the memoir, I realized to, like, there was so many other things, better things I could have told myself. Um, and I think like the big one would have just been that like, you will get out of here. Like you will get out of here. <laughs> like, you know, and not just high school, like Calgary and like this trap in your mind of like, I, I, we'd been pushed so hard by everything around us. Like go to university, go to university, figure out who you want to be. And that's scary when you're young. And you yeah. don't know what you want to be, especially when you're consumed by other things that seem more important, which at the time was our identity. You know, I think we were both so consumed with sexuality and who we were going to be saying, like, do I want to be a veterinarian or a social worker seemed <laughs> second to that. Yeah. And so I feel like I would just go back and be like, you know, chill out. Like, it's going to be OK and you can figure it out. And lots of our friends took a year or two off and they like are fucking killing it now. You know, like yeah. I also just to all young people, I'm always like, if you do not know what you want to do, that's OK. You'll figure it out. You will figure it out. Yeah. I mean, I agree with all of that. And I mean, I have no idea if like a scary adult version of myself um, had visited me in the night and had said, you will not believe what happens in the future. Like everything's going to be fine. I probably would have been like too Trip much acid. Yeah. yeah. But um, <laughs> but um, I do have this feeling like for all of my like, oh, I was girl crazy and I was hooking up with girls. I would actually be like lean in because like yeah. if you're going to become an adult and you're going to get into monogamous relationships and things slow way down, you know, yes. so I think actually I could have had even more fun in high school. But I think that even then I was a little bit puritanical about it all. Like I would like hook up with girls, but I kind of felt a lot of like shame and nervousness about it. And now I would be just like get wild. Yeah. I mean, to, if you think about it, if if a ghost did come and visit you both in the night and told you your future, you would be like, you you're crazy, you're on acid. You're I would have been yeah. like, there's no be like, two in the way. future. You're going to be two icons. You're going to have an insanely <laughs> successful music career. You're going to get nominated for Grammys. You're going to have a television show. You're going to write books. Everyone's going to want to fuck you. No. You'd be like, <laughs> you'd be like, that Jesus. can't be real. <laughs> this is pretty good for my self esteem. Is there yes. like an age cutoff where that's going to change? No, um, because no. I do. Are you kidding me? I bet you all the. I bet you all of like. You have to know that there's like 15 year olds right now that are like <laughs> freaking out for your music. Yes. Yeah. I think you know what I would actually backtrack just a little bit. It's partly to get away from this conversation, but also to say <laughs> that um, it doesn't have to be us going back to talk to us in high school. It's just like an adult, like yeah. a yeah. cool adult, like who was like 23 years old had like. And maybe this is a reason to have more than one child is that if even if we'd had an older sibling who yeah. said, hey, you know what? You're pretty dope. Like, you're going to be fine. You've got a lot of the skills that are going to, like, help you s float out there. So, like, yeah, because we had a lot of friends so that were telling us, like, Tegan would be like, I want to be a rock star. And our friends were like, you're going to be rock stars. It's not like we didn't have people telling us that right. we were like, so it's, it's someone you know, who's like a little bit further into adulthood. That someone that feels so, so, wiser, someone that yeah, feels so, more seasoned. And that came yeah. after high school. Cause like I'm thinking about Tegan, like I'm thinking about 
Lisa. Like we met we met a bunch of cool adults right. a little bit older than us when we got out of high school because we were like launching yeah, our music they, career. And they, they, calm, they calmed the waters. I think they that's did. all I mean is, is, is I guess you're right. We would have scared ourselves if we traveled back in a time machine. But if just someone who was like super, super cool and like 27 years old met me when I was 16 and was like, you're, you're dope. Yeah, you know, like you're going to be fine. Well, there was a couple of people who said that to me, but they also were trying well, to touch were, my boobs. Yeah, <laughs> very different. <laughs> I was going to say it's, it, it depends on the 27 year old. It's, <laughs> yeah. like, it's like, what are your intentions? Why are you talking to me? Also, 27 is old as fuck. I, I'm thinking more like 21 year olds. Yeah. And the, yeah, those guys were like, you're amazing. You're totally fantastic. You're going to do great. And I'm like, that didn't wasn't didn't calm me at all. So yeah. I don't know. You I need a lot to of get fucking, through it. You need you a lot of weirdos at hardcore shows i just remember meeting like 23 year old like straight edge vegans telling me that i was amazing and i was like (laughs) you're a fucking loser (laughs) yeah (laughs) but thank you you're right well you know what honestly your ultimately your question is the problem yeah you're the problem in this scenario (laughs) no i think it's like i mean not to be it actually like hurts me like physically pains me to think about my kid being being bullied or being insecure or being sad or like the thought right now of my kid Sid like feeling any of what I felt in his adolescence is so brutal but on the other hand that is that's the work that's the that's the stuff that you do to sort of like figure out how you are it's like it's like a metamorphosis you know it's painful like you have to shed some stuff and you have to feel bad and you have to whatever and like I don't it's not that I don't I going back and revisiting our time in high school made me realize that like we had just the right amount of like suffering to make yeah. us amazing and not like insufferable fuck faces who couldn't yeah. stand you know to feel a little bit bad like you know there's a little bit of pain and suffering that's required to like toughen you up for the world and i think like making it so that you never feel any of that stuff or that you think you're too good like my family was like you guys are great but nobody was like you can do anything you want like right, right. that's not true like that's not actually a true thing and i think this like mentality that you know high school has to be made to be this like you know just like cloud nine experience i think is 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 actually more detrimental than um than just letting us like suffer a little bit i would have suffered a little bit less slightly less but uh, mostly i can look back now and go that was pretty great all things considered well i'm obsessed and because of this <laughs> this is the last question of the show thank you guys for giving me so much of your time i'm sorry to keep you in talk jail um did you have senior superlatives? Was this a thing in your 3,000 person high school? Probably not. It wasn't. Therefore, I'm going to give you, well, I, the traditional senior superlative that you would have gotten, and you know what these are. This is when people yeah. would be like most likely to be yeah. on SNL or whatever. Obviously, you would get most likely to be famous. Like that's a no brainer because by the time you guys graduated, you were famous. Yeah. Yeah. I think I that's fair. S- I would say that it is fair that people would have. Uh, we were playing music enough during our senior year. Yes, I think you're right. I think it would have been something music related, most likely to succeed in music. Most likely yeah. to succeed in music, most likely to, I mean, it is kind of amazing that you were succeeding in music at the age that you were and that you continued to succeed and that here we are and that I'm in a personal acid trip right now, finishing a conversation, <laughs> talking with you both. You're very sweet. It's been a total joy. I'm. I it didn't feel like talk jail at all. We love uh, clearly. Look at us. We can't shut the fuck up. We love to talk about high school. I mean, I mean, it's just a weird time. It's a weird time. It's a cringy time, and it's a time that I'm also obsessed with. So I'm, you know, I'm gonna read your book. I'm watch gonna, our TV show. Watch, watch the TV show. Watch the no, show. I need to read. You know when you have that feeling when you wake up when you're like, I don't know words anymore. <laughs> I need to read to just learn more words. Got so it. I'm great gonna place read. To start. It's a great place to start. Um, where can everyone listen to your book? Find your book. Watch your television show. All of my listeners who you know must go and do that immediately. The book is available everywhere. Um, and like at bookshops you know that sort of thing <laughs> um and uh, uh, the audio version of it uh you can download on on all the same places where you buy books um audible and amazon and stuff and the, the audio version of the book is really dope it's like got all the we read song- it 
we read it and then in, in interspliced in between the chapters you hear the songs we're talking about that we wrote in high school because we actually have the demos from when we were in high school all those early recordings. and audio clips we used to interview ourselves on vhs constantly and so there's like interview um just shit of us talking as teenagers sounding yeah, very really cool and smart with strong canadian accents we do have strong canadian accents and then the tv show is if you are an amazon prime member you can watch it on amazon or otherwise it is free on an app called amazon freebie which you can download but um outside of the states in canada the uk germany australia it's all available on prime video yay oh what 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 heavy the names of the tv show i think the tv show is called high school right no, yeah both yeah. both both oh, the yeah. book both it's, uh the book our memoir is called high school and the and, tv show is TV also, show is called, also high called high school, high school. Yeah. yeah oh my god what a dream come true uh, tegan and sarah thank you so <laughs> much for joining me on my show this has just been amazing and thank you to everyone listening um my 75th episode an iconic 75th episode indeed and as i say every single time i wrap up this iconic podcast stay cool never change until next time, ciao. That was a headgum podcast. <laughs> <laughs>